Hitler was afraid of a war on two fronts. The 14th Army in Arakan is facing a dozen fronts at once, and one of them is the supply front. Never in the history of warfare has there been so difficult a problem. It's a country that's not fit to live in, much less to maintain a fighting force in for months on end, but it's got to be done, and it's being done. Always there's the most insidious enemy of all, the rain. It's trackless jungle dripping with disease. The hot stormy air soaks into the men's bodies, making them tired as mountaineers gasping for breath on the final peak of a mountain. Then there's the grim fight to keep body and soul together. Shelter for the night is a few flimsy tents perched on a hillside. Every box of supplies must be hauled up the long weary climb from the foot of the hill. Water must be passed from hand to hand from the only available spring. Yet somehow, men ready to drop from exhaustion get their food. Then there's the Jap front proper. For him, that shifts every day, backwards. He expected to fight, but he never expected to be remorselessly shelled to pieces. That's what's happening, and batteries like these, manhandled into position, have turned the tide of war. Japanese storm Meiyu Ridge in force. Allied artillery turns the attack into a rout. This is the reality behind the brief communiques you read in your newspapers. Yet out of it all, day by day, comes news of victory. Like a mass of cloud was the smoke screen thrown out by the German battleship as the attacking aircraft approached the Norwegian fjord in which she was lying. Through the billowing smoke, the turpits opened up with every gun she had. Then the 12,000 pound bombs began to take effect. At least three direct hits were registered. The firing stopped and a great cloud of smoke rose from the shattered vessel now lying on her side. So ended the inglorious career of Germany's most powerful warship.
When Mr. Churchill arrived at an airfield near Paris, General de Gaulle greeted him warmly on this, his first visit to the French capital since May 1940. As Britain's premier drove to the Arc de Triomphe for the wreath-laying ceremony, it was obvious that Paris was about to witness one of the most moving episodes in her history. This was the first Armistice Day ceremony in the city in five years. And as Mr. Churchill and General de Gaulle arrived to lay their wreaths, the scene underlined not only Anglo-French sympathy throughout the years of sacrifice, but also the need for full Anglo-French cooperation in the years to come. cannon shot announced the hour of 11 and a minute of silence. Afterwards, the Premier signed the Golden Book of Paris before he and the general proceeded on their walk down the Champs-Élysées. It was a walk which proved to be a supreme personal triumph for Winston Churchill, for his faith in the rebirth of France and for his untiring work towards that end. It was a demonstration too of French gratitude and friendship for Great Britain and her allies. As the great parade went past, the story was one of such enthusiasm as can seldom have been seen in any capital, and how Paris welcomed the reappearance of the uniforms of the Allies. In May 1940, Churchill offered Frenchmen equal citizenship with Britons. In June 1940, when hope seemed dead, he promised France that her greatness would be restored. No wonder they cheered him on November the 11th, 1944. A great day for Paris, a great moment for Winston Churchill. <laughs> 